Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the next video on the poem um, On Her Blindness by Adam Thorpe. So before we get started, just a quick warning with this one. Um, it is quite an upsetting poem. It's about um, the poet's mother who went blind and then died. So my advice is obviously if you are feeling emotional or if you've experienced something like that in your family recently or even some time ago and you think this may upset you, then choose the most appropriate time to watch it. Um, and if you need help or support from anyone, then please um, do talk to someone, do get that help, okay? Um, but otherwise, let's get into the poem. Um, one, one thing is a quite straightforward poem. It's fairly easy to understand. As I said, it's quite emotional and, and quite upsetting, and quite moving uh, in places as well, okay? So, um, my mother could not bear being blind, to be honest. So the opening line, like some of the other lines in these anthologies of poem, is a very direct statement. Um, and it's first person, my mother, so you've got that personal aspect to it, um, and could not bear. So we get the sense of how difficult this was, what struggle this was um, with the mother losing that sight. One shouldn't say it, one should hide the fact that catastrophic handicaps are hell. And then interestingly, in this poem, we get the direct um, contrast between the kind of um, the personal effect this had on the family and, and the personal and private life of this family versus kind of public uh, views and society's views. So you've got the personal pronoun uh, my and my mother. And then you've got this idea of one shouldn't, this, this unknown one, this just generic idea of what one should and shouldn't say. Um, and the formal register, the formality of that one should, one shouldn't, you know, um, it kind of conjures up images of the um, British stiff upper lip, you know, putting a brave face on things, not showing how you're feeling, um, being stoic at all times. Um, but there's a contrast throughout this poem between that kind of perhaps public perception and what the appearance that we might um, put on for others and actually our private inner feelings. I suppose the one as well, um, which is used to replace either you or I in that sentence, you shouldn't or I shouldn't, um, it's okay when it's hypothetical, when it's detached, when it's not you, perhaps. Okay, um, and then we've got the idea again, of course, this has been catastrophic handicaps. So the word catastrophe, you know, its original meaning is just a big event. It's been taken often to mean a, a really um, awful event, but actually it's just about the size of something, the enormity of something. So it, stress, it stresses the enormity of this life-changing um, thing that happened and the enormity of the word being used here, the handicap, the disability that um, going blind causes or is. And handicaps are hell. So the idea of this being hell as well, you've got that biblical metaphoric language, so emphasizing how difficult it was for this woman to go blind, how much she suffered, you know, the connotations of hell, suffering, punishment being explored here. But this idea that society, this one, this formal register, one should hide the fact that it's a catastrophic hell. That apparently is what we should do, put on a show, pretend, hide. And that's the kind of the idea that the poet is exploring in this poem. One tends to hear publicly from those who bear it like a Roman or somehow find joy in the fight. So the poet explores those people who, when they uh, have, when this happens to them, when they go blind or when they're dying, that they seem to publicly and again, the difference between the public self and the private self, they publicly bear it like a Roman. So the idea of um, the simile of like a Roman, Romans being brave, being noble, being strong. So you show yourself to be strong. Um, but again, that's the public self, perhaps different to the private self, or somehow find joy in the fight. There are those who seem to find joy in this fight, in this struggle. Um, and I don't know, there could even be a tone of kind of cynicism there or, or disdain, perhaps, for those people who behave in that way, perhaps, or just um, a lack of comprehension, perhaps, for the speaker or the poet, you know, who cannot imagine um, behaving in that way and how actually for him it was a very, very different experience and not something, that, you know, certainly not something that he enjoyed um, and didn't see his mother 
enjoy the fight either. But there is, as the poem goes through, perhaps an element of maybe her being brave like a Roman and putting on a, on a front, perhaps, for public appearances. <clears throat> You've got the full stop here dividing the, the others, these hypothetical or anecdotal people, with the then she. And from here, the poem really narrows on the main subject of the poem, the mother who is going or has gone blind and then dies. She turned to me once in a Paris restaurant. And we've got different ways that we can interpret the lines here. She turned to me once in a Paris restaurant. So one thing it allows us to do is kind of picture that scene, that intimate scene, the two of them in a Paris restaurant. Paris probably quite deliberately chosen, uh, you know, whether it was autobiographical and true or not, but because Paris has the connotations of being, you know, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, lots to see. Um, it's a romantic city full of culture. Um, and perhaps it then will emphasize when you lose your sight, all the things that you can lose, you know, not, no longer being able to see the Eiffel Tower or the Champs-Élysées or the Louvre or Notre Dame, or whatever it is um, in Paris that's so extraordinary and beautiful to see which perhaps then emphasise that tone of kind of mourning in it that we can have in this poem of loss, not being able to see those things. So she turned to me once in a Paris restaurant, so we get this clear visual image. It's almost as if we are now being privy to this very personal memory. We are part of it, we're in the moment with them, which is further by she turned to me, that, that verb phrase, that active phrase, it puts us in the moment uh, with the two. But also she turned to me and you know, turning to someone has the connotations of depending on someone, relying on someone, trusting someone. So we get that double meaning here as well. We perhaps appreciate the kind of close relationship between the poet and his mother. She turned to me once in a Paris restaurant, still not finding the food on the plate with her fork or not so that it stayed on. Try it in a pitch black room. So we get this very honest account throughout this entire poem, this very conversational tone of this poem. Um, there's no glamorizing this, there's no glorifying the actions. Uh, the poet is just reflecting on what happened and, and tells us quite honestly how his mother, you know, she's, she's struggling to find the food with her fork and then feed herself. So we get that um, previous grand image of Paris contrasted with this kind of simple thing that she can no longer do so it perhaps draws our attention to that as well and we get a real sense of sympathy you know for what that might be like we get the parenthesis and the directive try it you know the the poet is encouraging us perhaps to further our empathy with his mother and to and try it to, to see what that would be like to imagine and to put yourselves in in her shoes and experience it for yourself and whispered and here is where we get this kind of private moment where she has turned to her son and she is confiding in her son. And what she tells him privately, very, very different to public perception and, and the idea of people bearing it like a Roman. But she whispers, it's living hell, to be honest, Adam. So that conversational style, that very honest account. And now again, the repetition of hell. We have the metaphor of hell previously. And we also got the repetition of to be honest. So, you know, what you can certainly say about this poem is it's meant to be an honest portrayal of what happened. And even the name Adam, I suppose it makes it sound even more personal, but it also reinforces that it's an autobiographical uh, poem. If I gave up hope of a cure, I'd bump myself off. So that conversation of the voice of the mother continues what she said. Um, we get the colloquial language like we've had in some other poems, I'd bump myself off, which perhaps adds to the realism or the authenticity of this poem. You know, and that's, that's why she's kind of continuing, actually, is, is hope of a cure. She's not accepting this. Um, she, she's kind of fighting on and hoping there'll be something else. I don't recall what I replied, but it must have been the usual sop, inadequate, the locked in sun. So that really, really honest account continues. And there's almost a sense of kind of um, 
I don't know, maybe guilt here that um, the son couldn't do enough and whatever they did would be inadequate. You know, the enjambement here really draws your attention to that word and, and helped further perhaps by the colon after it. He felt, the poet felt, inadequate, not good enough, helpless um, to what his mother has just said to him. You know, referring to what we said, the usual sop, the kind of cliches, the common things that people say. He can't remember exactly what he said. Again, adding perhaps to the, the realism of this poem, the authenticity of the poem, because we don't always recall things um, entirely correctly. The colon then draw your attention to the second part, the locked in sun. You know, he's, he's actually paralyzed um, in terms of he cannot help. So he feels that kind of locked-in syndrome when you can you can think you can't move. You know, he can't do anything to help. He's kind of still in this paralysis of hopelessness. She kept her dignity, though, even when bumping into walls like a dodgem. Her sense of direction did not improve when cast inward. So although there's a simile bumping into walls like a dodgem, for me, it's not, it's not comical, it's not humorous, it's just matter of fact. Um, and the poet's kind of dispelling those myths, the idea that uh, people say, if you lose one sight, it heightens all your others. And he says, well, her sense of direction did not improve. So when she lost her sight, that didn't improve her, her other senses. She wasn't any better um, at being able to move around or find her way around. You've got the honest home, she kept her dignity, a sense of pride as well, admiration talking about his mother, tinged with um, sadness and mourning that kind of goes through this poem. No built in compass, as my father joked. So we've got the inclusion now of the father's speech as well. So broadening the idea in this poem that this wasn't just about one person or two people, now it's about three people. This is a collective experience. You know, somebody going blind doesn't just affect one person, but here it's affecting a whole family. Instead, she pretended to ignore the void or laughed it off. So again, a sense of kind of admiration, perhaps, for the mother who is um, putting up this front and, and trying to pretend that things are okay. But as is running through this poem, is that disparity between what she's admitted privately to her son and the public self that she's conveying for other people, pretending, ignoring, uh, laughing it off as it goes on in the next stanza. And just as I said that the poet broadens the experience, it's not just him, it wasn't just his father, then he starts to talk about his children, so the kind of grandchildren, the kids affected by this as well. So we get a real sense of this being a whole family Affected. Um, and with that, I suppose it becomes more mournful and more sad with the inclusion of, of the things um, that she no longer found absolute enjoyment from with the grandchildren. Or saw things she couldn't see. You know, she, she pretends to be able to see um, the kids offer the latest drawing. Oh, what a beautiful drawing, what a beautiful picture. She can't see it and yet she's smiling. She's putting on that front for her family. And the poet remembers that, reflects on that. And again, perhaps that tone of sadness, mourning, um, but also maybe admiration for the strength of his mother to be able to do that and how she thought about others before herself. Or show their new toy. So we forget at times the long, slow side had finished in a vision as blank as stone. You've got more um, commas and sejura here than in lots of other places in this poem. So the pace seems to slow um, as if the, the poet is kind of taking time to reflect on this particular moment, these particular moments, these particular memories that were very, very important and, and very, very sad. The simile towards the end, uh, vision, as blank as stone, here's the real kind of um, sense of mourning and sadness. Um, the stone, perhaps connotations of being kind of cold, lifeless, soulless. So by implication, perhaps the suggestion of this is how 
her life had become or was becoming. It was becoming less full of life, less full of colour, less full of vibrancy, more cold, more detached. She couldn't have the real um, feelings and enjoy that she would have had previously looking at her grandchildren's pictures or toys. The sibilance drawing our attention to the slow slide, the sense that this was something that happened over a course of time. <clears throat> and again, then the poet continues to remember some of the other things that um, his mother did to drive the old Lanchester long after it was safe down the Berkshire lanes. So we're told again, quite honestly, how she drove her car for much longer than she should, you know, when her, eye was, when her eyes were failing. Um, and we get, I suppose, with that and the other things that she continued to do, she visited exhibitions, admired films, sink into television, her um, determination to, to continue to be independence and um, independent, sorry, and her force of will um, and how she didn't want to perhaps accept what was happening to her. And she wanted to continue doing all the things that she'd always done. And maybe part of that was putting on a brave show. And again, it's, it's, it's difficult to determine whether the tone is admiration or mourning, you know, and, and, a, and a sympathy and a sadness for that. The sympathy and the sadness and the tone of mourning is definitely made clear when we continue sink into television while looking the wrong way. So it's made very clear to us that, um, you know, she cannot enjoy the films or the exhibitions the way that she used to, and that it is just a pretense. You've got the end stop there, again, to kind of emphasise this line where we get a real sense of mourning. And then the shift to kind of move us towards the end of the poem and the end of her life. Her last week alive, a fortnight back. So we get a sense that actually um, this poem was written very soon after the poet's mother's death. And this would perhaps be quite a raw feeling was golden weather, of course. The autumn trees around the hospital ablaze with colour, the ground royal with leaf fall. So we almost get a cruel or painful irony here from the poet, you know, um, in her final week, the world was full of life, full of colour. She couldn't see that or enjoy that. And we get these kind of universal ideas between the thin line between life and death and the harshness of death. Um, I told her this forgetting as she sat too weak to move, staring at nothing. So there's a tone of guilt here, you know, that the, um, the poet admits to us again in this honest fashion of the poem um, that he'd forgotten perhaps that his mother had gone blind and couldn't see this and feels maybe a tinge of guilt for talking about the the beauty of, of the world outside and the, and the nature outside in the way that he did. The Jean line here, staring at nothing, you know, really uh, emphasises the bleak, um, the bleakness of her situation. So that the, the lack of sight, and because this is nearing the end of her life as well, the kind of nothingness that there may be. Oh yes, I know. So that this very um, polite voice of the mother. Oh yes, I know, she said. It's lovely out there. So perhaps the poet remembers her, her strength to the very end or her pretense to the very end um, about it being lovely and trying to enjoy it and trying to embrace it and being selfless and not um, breaking down or crumbling or, or attacking her son for saying something which could be perceived to be insensitive. Dying has made her no more sightless, but now she can't pretend. We get the present tense now, brings us right back to the moment when this poem is written, after the death of his mother, now she can't pretend. Again, that honest, direct statement. Her eyelids were closed in the coffin. It was up to us to believe she was watching somewhere in the end. 
And as with all of the poems, you know, and this is just, this entire thing is just my interpretation of the poem. And as always, I'm really interested to hear your interpretation of the poem. I think the ending is, is, is interesting to consider whether you read it with a, a positive spin or a negative spin. I guess if you're reading it positively, um, it was up to us to believe. It's a sense of kind of um, her handing over the mantle. It's down to you now. You need to take up this challenge. You need to keep the belief. You need to believe in me still. Believe I exist in some way, somewhere. And so it's that idea of there being a life after death in, in some respect. But the opposite of that then, the negative, is that, you know, this, this whole poem is based on the idea of, of the mother pretending, um, believing something which wasn't true. And so if it is up to the poet and his family at the end to believe she was watching, and throughout the poem there's been a pretense of watching, then sadly it suggests that maybe the poet is questioning whether there is um, a life afterwards and whether she can be watching over him and the family. Remember, this is only written two weeks after the death, so it'll still be quite raw, perhaps, and there might be that tone of kind of anger that you go through when you're grieving for someone that you've lost. Okay, so as I said, it's it's not a it's not a happy poem, um, but there is tenderness in there. There's real love in there, um, and of course, you know, death sadly is a part of life. Um, and it's a very, very honest account by the poet of what ha he happened to his mother. And there's lots um, that he's proud of and there's lots that he admires. OK, so as I said, hopefully uh, you haven't found it too upsetting. If you have, please do talk to someone. Please do get in touch if you need to. Take care.